My name is Vepav Singh, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow of the British Academy, which is the UK's voice for the humanities and social sciences. My research focuses on technological change and its effect on modes of communication. And in this video, I'm going to take you on a quick tour of my collection of early typewriters. Engaging with these artifacts as sources of information tells us a great deal about how ideas and practices associated with specific technologies have shaped and continue to shape the everyday experience of writing. For most people today, the QWERTY keyboard, or a slight variation of it, is the main interface for daily text-based interactions. So much so that you might not realize that the idea of a keyboard itself is a legacy of a very different era of communications. Before it took its current form on so many of our devices, the keyboard, as the word suggests, was literally a musical instrument adapted to fit the letters of the alphabet, first as part of the printing telegraph, and from there to typewriters and typesetting machines. At some point, most of us have wondered why the letters on our keyboards are organized the way they are, QWERT and so on. There are many urban legends around this arrangement and its history is as fascinating as it is controversial, and definitely not a subject to be tackled in this short video, but take a look at the arrangement of the letters on this printing telegraph from the Science Museum in London. Compare its rows with the bottom two rows on your own keyboard, and you can find a lot of clues about the foundational logic of the arrangement. But the typewriters I want to show you today are non-keyboard machines, known as index typewriters. There is a surprisingly wide range and variety of such machines, and I will only be showing a few as examples. Index typewriters are not primitive versions of what we think of today as the standard typewriter, which is keyboard-based. These machines were not stages in the development of keyboard-based typewriters. Most index typewriters, in fact, appeared after and were marketed concurrently with keyboard-based typewriters that became commercially available in the 1870s. On index machines such as this, the process of physically selecting the desired letter and then imprinting it on paper involved two separate steps and usually two separate mechanisms. But the sheer range of imaginative responses to organizing and mechanizing the alphabet is astonishing. And there are hybrids such as this example that does have a keyboard, uh, but reinterprets it in a dial form. The arrangement of letters on a machine, simple though it may seem at first glance, was a critical function at the intersection of a number of different considerations. It responded to a combination of factors such as the ease, economy, and speed of movement of the device and mechanisms condu conducive to uh, hand movements. And of course, uh, the key consideration here was uh, characteristics of written language. For example, some letters or letter combinations occur more frequently than others, and you would want to have those common combinations placed strategically for quicker access. So typewriters with linear slots involved very different considerations and offered very different possibilities for the layout of the alphabet than a machine with a dial mechanism, for example. A stylus and pointer setup, such as in this machine, conceptualized the alphabetical arrangement as a grid, uh, while concentric approaches offered yet other connections and interactions. Now, this machine, for example, was publicized around World War I as a portable typewriter for reporting directly from the battlefield, a machine that could be used on horseback. Less daring machines proposed writing in train compartments, in parks, or in bed without the fear of spilling ink or revealing an unsteady hand. These may seem like small attractions, but note the radical implications of these changes. One could work around handwriting as a marker of education, social class, gender, physical impairment, and of course, replicate the authority of a printed document. These machines were cheap, portable, and advertised as easy to use, though they were not always so. They implied little or no investment in training and maintenance. Most importantly, index typewriters were personal objects to be used at home, on the move, indoors or outdoors, unlike their contemporary keyboard-based counterparts that addressed the question of portability only much later. At a critical historical moment then, index typewriters played an important role in making what were then new tools and technologies of writing far more approachable, taking the typewriter far beyond the realm of the trained professional worker to amateur typists, adventurers, enthusiasts, and the general public. Keyboard-based typewriters stipulated the use of both hands, all 10 fingers, 
index typewriters did not. As we've seen, several index machines, in fact, experimented with one-handed operations. And some of them, like this one, were aimed at people with limited dexterity. It is useful to remember that keyboard-based typewriting, a process that seems entirely natural to us today, is an acquired skill and a difficult one to master at that. The general public had to be persuaded of its usefulness when it was introduced and also needed to have access to some form of training. Considerable resources were put into this process of popular acceptance and skill acquisition, which spawned a whole new industry. This self-typing instructor is one of my favorite examples. It was meant to be a cheap substitute to enrolling in a typing school and was aimed at beginners who could wear it on their hands to practice. Thinking about our own experience today, much of our typing on the go is done using a single finger or two thumbs. However, on the same keyboard that demand two hands, ten fingers, it is useful to highlight this disjunction because it points to the deep impact that keyboards have had on our thinking about text input, despite being just one of many possible ways in which people have gone about handling or accessing the alphabet. Recent developments point to the fact that our interactions with text and typing do require some further adaptations, if not alternatives like wearable devices um, that allow text input using coded touch sensors. And then, of course, there's the whole world of speech-to-text conversion, but the resilience of the keyboard as our primary gateway to text is still quite palpable. Thinking about text input in a different way is especially relevant when we expand our view beyond the Latin alphabet to see how the numerous languages and scripts of the world have dealt with the same question related to text and technology. But that's a subject for another occasion, and I will conclude this brief tour with the hope that next time you're typing on a keyboard, you will look at that process with a heightened sense of curiosity.